Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our session at the first all virtual build conference. We hope all of you are safe and healthy. In this session, we will talk about accessibility testing of your software products, and we will show you the tools that will help you make your products accessible to everyone. I'm sure many of you are passionate about accessibility and accessible products, but feel like they don't know where to start from. I know some of you are already using accessibility insights and are ready to learn about the new products and features we will be introducing this year. Well, there will be something for everyone in this session, and we hope you enjoy it. Let's start with some basics. There are 1.2 billion people in the world with a disability. Statistics show that more than 70% of people without a disability would benefit from more accessible applications. If we are not enabling everyone to use our applications, access our applications, benefit from our applications, we are leaving a whole set of customers in the dust. We are here to talk about building applications that are accessible to everyone. Companies like Microsoft spend millions of dollars every year to fix accessibility bugs found by manual testers at the end of the product development life cycle. We're here to show you how to find and fix these accessibility issues much earlier in the development cycle to help you reduce churn and deliver a better experience for all of our users. My name is Addy, and I'm the lead PM on Accessibility Insights. I'm here with Mark, who is the brain behind our products, the engineering manager for Accessibility Insights. Hey, Mark. Hi, Addy. Okay. We all know how important building accessible products is. We all know how expensive it could be if we check for accessibility after the fact. We'll start with a real life example. Mark, I believe you had some personal experience with some accessibility challenges recently. Yes, I sure did. About a year ago, my wife broke her leg and was in a wheelchair for several months. As soon as she got home from the hospital, we quickly realized there were several significant ways that our home environment did not match her mobility. First off was the front door, which had only a single step, but that step turned out to be a very significant obstacle for her. I've been working in the accessibility space for about four years now, but this is the first time I've been required to address a mobility issue in my home. I knew I needed some sort of ramp to get past this step, so I researched the relevant standards and building codes. After researching several options, I landed on a portable um, temporary ramp that I was able to acquire quickly. With the help of my teenage son, we installed it and allowed my wife to be able to enter and exit our home. It was not ideal, but it was enough to unblock her access to the home. That sounds a lot like how we address software accessibility. Sometimes the first issues to, add, to address are the initial blockers that users encounter, such as installation or login screens. Well, there are many parallels to software accessibility in this story, and it was on my mind quite a bit as we went through it. Just like with software, I needed to do a lot of research to ensure that what I was doing was safe and practical. I didn't really have to invent the solution. I just needed good access to the standards and best practice for these situations and apply them. Too bad you didn't have accessibility insights for homes. <laughs> that would have been very helpful. Well, soon after this, as the summer weather started, we realized we needed a second ramp to our back you know, to give my wife back. Um, give my wife access to the backyard and the patio to enjoy those summer days. That makes me think of how accessibility is not a one-time effort. It is a continuous journey to address our users' needs as they come to us. After my wife's leg healed, we removed the ramps, but it started us thinking about how the home was designed to begin with. Frankly, this aluminum ramp was not very attractive. How much better would it have been to address accessibility in the design of the home and build it in? After this, my wife and I I began considering the long-term accessibility of our home and we're planning on addressing these issues as we do some remodeling. So true, so true. We have a few more real life examples for you. I hope you can take them with a smile. Uh, we will describe all images as we go and be inclusive in our presentation and so should you. And to make sure that the ones of you who are multitasking right now are not missing out. On the first slide, we have a ramp with a, with a a wheelchair ramp built with a hole to accommodate a tree trunk that goes in the middle of the ramp. Intent is not enough. We need to think about usability. Don't follow the design blindly and win the Not My Job Award. On a side note, I'm pretty sure this is in my hometown. So on this next slide, we have a really, really steep wheelchair ramp 
And with a giant uh, plant at the bottom, which I, I guess you're supposed to crash into, um, it says we all love extreme sports. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I would enjoy this. Yeah, compliance, com doesn't, compliance doesn't necessarily make your products accessible. We need to consider usability and make sure our users are able to take full advantage of our tools. On the next slide, we have a wheelchair ramp on a set of stairs, but the top three stairs don't have the ramp on them. The ramp starts on the fourth stair. And this gets me thinking how band-aids and patches are not an efficient way of thinking about accessibility. So all of this makes me think about how we address accessibility in many of our products. We design and we build. And then at the end, we ask manual testers to let us know how much we should have done to make it accessible. These late changes are costly and often lead us with a much less than ideal user experience. How much better will it be to think about accessibility from the beginning, design with accessibility in mind, build with accessibility in mind, and make sure that everything we build will be usable by all of our users. Today, after this session, you will be armed with some tools that will help you build software with accessibility in mind. It'll help you find and fix accessibility issues before they reach manual testers and well before they're, they're going to become a hindrance to your customers. Before we begin, we would like to show you a short introductory video of our team and our mission. We hope you enjoy it. What we're doing at Microsoft is making sure that there's an environment of humans that can make some good decisions. And so that means that we're investing in educating our employees, we're investing in hiring more employees with disabilities, and that we're helping just provide the tools to help people make better decisions. I gradually lost my sight over uh, a period of many years. I had to change a flight yesterday and I was looking around on the website, and as often happens, strangely, the most important piece of information that I needed was not visible. It happens literally every day, all the time. When I talk to developers, they are always committed to the quality of their software. And when they understand that accessibility is a key aspect of quality, they will immediately devote themselves to it. So what I want to do is take those developers that have this passion and give them the tools they need to do the job right. That's Accessibility Insights. It's a tool that they can integrate into their enlistments, their build system, or their regular workflow, and keep it top of mind every day. And not just at a code level, but to understand the impact that the issues have to our customers. One of the most common issues is when an item on a web page cannot be used with a screen reader. This can happen when an image doesn't have an alt text specified. Our software can actually point that right out. We'll draw a box around it and we'll flag it and we'll say, you got to fix this. It's a quick tool that takes a couple minutes to run and our developers, regardless of their accessibility knowledge, can easily then debug the issue and fix it in the product before it gets to customers. We are finally able to share this with the community by releasing it to developers all across the world and also to share it as an open source project. We are going to allow developers to make contributions to make Accessibility Insights even better. My hope for Accessibility Insights is that it becomes a reason that any developer has really no reason not to make their software accessible. It's important because not only does it build on open source, but being open source, it allows us to contribute to the greater good. And so we know the industry as a whole is on a journey to becoming more accessible, to understanding what it really means to be inclusive. And by contributing to that community and, and offering our own support, we're hoping to kind of create that give and take where we can learn more, but we can also share what we learn. So the video you just watched was from last March when we released Accessibility Insights to the World as a public download as a, and as an open source project. The response from the community, both inside and outside of Microsoft, has been very positive. We're excited to see our team have an impact outside of the company. The products we have released so far and will help you check for accessibility on various platforms. We have a tool that would lead you to a full WellCAC 2.1 compliance for your websites a tool that would help you make your Windows applications accessible. Automated test engine for Windows applications, something we spoke about last year at Build, a CI-CD integration for your Build pipeline. And our latest and greatest tool, automated tests that will help you check accessibility on Android applications. 
So our goal is to shift the accessibility left in the development process by having developers use accessibility insights while they're building the product. Our dream is by the time the code gets to the manual testers, they find very few or no bugs and we reduce the rework. This will save us time, money, and development effort. It'll save us from waiting for weeks to release our products or having to pull our products from the market if accessibility issues are found by the end users. And most importantly, it unlocks a whole community of users to take advantage of the products that Microsoft offers. To start using Accessibility Insights, you go to our website, accessibilityinsights.io, where you can download the products, read more about what we do, who we are, and you can follow our future developments. The website will further explain what all of our products do and where you can get updates on new products as we introduce them. A few more things to mention. Accessibility Insights automated checks come with a zero false positives promise. Zero false positives means you can rely on our tools to highlight only real errors. These tools are not gonna give you a lot of noise to ignore. And I'll give you our promise, if you find a false positive, we will fix it. Accessibility Insights will help you get to full WCAG 2.1 compliance. Understanding and implementing a new, all new rules was a big part of our efforts during the last year. And Accessibility Insights for Web continues to use AxCore as its scanning engine. AxCore is the industry standard for accessibility scanning as built by our good friends at DQ Systems. Very early in the development of Accessibility Insights, we made the decision to base all of our scanning on the AxCore open source scanning engine, and I am so pleased that we did. It helps us with keeping our promise about zero false positives and also ensures that we can benefit from all the community improvements in this widely used scanning engine. Awesome. Now let's check what's new in Accessibility Insights this year. I know that some of you have already seen a demo of Accessibility Insights for Web if you attended our session last year. Now we'll briefly show you the tool and we will highlight some of the new features. We will demo the tool with a page I created a while back. In my free time, I teach karate. And when a friend of mine who's a sensei and I opened up our dojo, we needed a website. So what you see was our starting point years ago. And so let's check out this website for accessibility. To start, we're gonna click on the heart icon to launch the extension. Once the extension is launched, we see the three different workflows that Accessibility Insights for Web has. FastPass, which is the most common accessibility issues found in less than five minutes. Assessment, a walkthrough to a guided process of, of um, assessing accessibility compliance and ad hoc tools, as well as a link to a three minute video introduction that would remind you of anything we said in this session and you forgot about. So we're gonna start with FastPass because we wanna do this quickly. And right away, uh, you see it is fast. And we see that we have uh, nine total failed instances. And right here, we see that the color contrast of uh, some of these elements on the page is insufficient. Uh, particularly this text that says where the heart and sport, where the art and the sword meet um, has a contrast ratio of uh, less than the required 4.5 to one. This is actually the most common accessibility issue, but at least that's what our research shows. Absolutely. And with each failure, you would see the path, a snippet, how to fix the information, and everything you would need to go and fix that. And if you're not in a position to fix it immediately, I can go ahead and file an issue. Um, I can file an issue in my GitHub repo, or I can also file it on my Azure boards or in Azure DevOps. Um, this issue has all of the information that was shown there in uh, detail so that I can assign this to a developer and they can begin fixing the issue. But that's not it. We're not done. We're not done yet. So um, the, the other half of FastPass is tab stops. And one of the, one of the biggest issues that, you, that a lot of pages struggle with is the fact that uh, users using a screen reader have to interact exclusively using the keyboard, or often, most of the time, it's exclusively using the keyboard. So the tab stops test 
um, helps with that by, by actually providing a visualization of the tab order. And I can see the order in which we're going through these elements. And it draws a line. And it draws a line between each of these elements and show us the sequence of the elements that you would tab through. That is a really cool feature. And in this case, it looks like we are good because the elements that should be selectable are selectable. So that, that completes FastPass. And this is the process that it's a less than five minute check that gets you most of the, uh, find some of the most common accessibility issues, but it won't be sufficient to ensure that you're compliance. Um, in order to get to full WCAG 2.1 compliance, we're gonna run the second workflow, which is called assessment. And so assessment consists of 24 automated assisted and manual tests. So we've already run the automated checks and keyboard navigation during FastPass. So now we're gonna focus on another aspect of this. And we're gonna run the assessment. And so as part of assessment, runs the automated checks. And yeah. I don't Since like we didn't run the, sorry. That's no, all right. I'm just gonna launch this part again. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, so to get to full WCAG 2.1 compliance, we're going to run the second workflow, which is assessment. Natty, why don't you tell us about assessment? Excellent. So assessment consists of 24 um, assisted and manual tests. First, we run the automated checks, same as the automated checks. Since we didn't run it on this page, we run them again. Second, we run the keyboard, which we already saw how to do. And then there is a set of tests that we need to still run. Let's go to one of the most common accessibility issues, which is related to images. And in this case, we could check text alternatives. For every image, we need to have a text alternative on the page. And if Mark toggles the visual helper here, it will highlight the images that we have on the page. Let's see what happens. Well, what we see here is that these images have some rather unusual text alternatives. So for example, um, this one here, that is actually you, Addy, um, it, on your photo, it says accessible name is Senpai, San Francisco, blah, 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 dot JPEG, which I'm assuming is the name of the file that was originally uh, used to put the website together. Correct, correct. So not a, these are not good accessible names, so we can mark these as a fail. And that provides a way to indicate on the report in the future that you need to go ahead and deal with that. A report, you say? What report? A report. Well, that is a great segue. We'll show you the report. And this is a Dojo website. Like I can put the... Uh, the description and I press export and it'll create a uh, HTML file which has a complete all the details about all the issues including those automated checks and also the images that I flagged as fails and together with the path the snippet and exactly what the issue is so that it makes it easy for someone later on to go back and uh, and address these issues in a more detailed way but one last thing we should talk about is info and examples. Absolutely. So there's there, a lot of these requirements, they're, they're difficult to understand, and especially when you're new. And in order to help people who are new to accessibility or people who just, just want to make sure they have all the best information, we've provided detailed information on all of our requirements. So, for example, for text alternative, we have this information about why it matters. And one of the things I really like is it actually has a quote um, written from a user's perspective to indicate that a user, what a user might say. So a user might say, I don't rely on my sense of sight to understand images, video, or audio content. Provide me with text alternatives for all non-text contents. My screen reader or braille display can describe the content and help me understand how the content shapes meaning, context, and purposes. I find that this really helps um, developers and uh, everyone involved in delivering accessible software to really understand why things are important. 
And uh, also there's examples. So it talks about um, an example of a fail and an example of a pass. And then also a ton of blue links for anyone who wants to go really, really deep into um, the details. We have a lot of, uh, we link to a lot of detailed resources on this. Um, and there are dozens and dozens and dozens of these pages within the tool. So Accessibility Insights for Web is really a great tool to learn about accessibility if you've never done anything with it. So I'm really excited about this next one. This is uh, actually the first public demo of an exciting product we just finished called Accessibility Insights for Android. And uh, in order to show it off, I'm gonna show you a demo app that was actually created by a member of our team, uh, Fernanda, who, um, who created an application with a demo app to show off accessibility issues. She actually broke the app further to introduce more accessibility issues in it. She's very good at breaking things. And I'm launching um, Accessibility Insights for Android. And in order to start, I have to put in the port number. And the port number is 62442. And for all of you Harry Potter fans, this spells out magic. So now we've noticed we've connected to the device. Now this, this is running in an emulator, but it could be just as easily run on a physical device, but the emulator is a lot easier to demonstrate in this, in this manner. And with one more click, it runs a scan against the application, and immediately we see um, a screen that actually looks somewhat familiar. And if this does look familiar to you, it should, because it's built from the same code as the Chrome and Edge extension. We want to have a consistent user experience so users would be able to work across multiple platforms easily. So we have um, some issues. That, uh, that we have here. This one is called Active View Name. This is uh, analogous to the alt text um, on the web platform, and it's exactly the same sort of issue. There is a button, in this case, there's a button with this arrow here that does not have a content description. And uh, there's, no, there's no alt text for it. And uh, this is uh, to go back to the previous screen, but there's no way that a user would know that that's what, it would, that's what it does if it was reading on a screen reader. So you need to provide uh, a meaningful content description. Um, and here's our old friend, color contrast. Um, the text here for the, for the flower is a very, very light shade of, of gray and uh, as, I'm having a difficulty reading it as it is, and it needs to be at least 4.5 to one, and it's actually only 1.959 to one. And the last issue here is um, touch size. And touch size is something that's somewhat unique to, um, to mobile development and touch devices in particular. These, this button over here is, um, is actually um, smaller than the minimum requirements, which is 44 device pixels. Um, it's, since it's, it's only 30 pixels wide, it's actually a little too small um, for a person to be able to touch reliably. Yeah, absolutely. We've all experienced that at some point in life, that fingering a button on a, on a mobile device. So this is, this is very new. Um, we, we've just, we just released it. At this point, we have automated checks. And we've received great feedback from our pilot teams. We're working on exciting, on extending the solution to include focus order and soon assisted tests over time. We are really excited to keep developing this product and we really are welcome any feedback you have. Next, we will show you another one of our new initiatives, Accessibility Insights Action for GitHub. This is available for you to use today, even though it hasn't been wi widely publicized. On this screen is our website, and being the Accessibility Insights team, we need to make absolutely sure that our website never has any accessibility issues. So in order to help ourselves do this, we also have created, we want to be able to automate this as much as we can, and we want to help everyone be able to automate. So we created the Accessibility Insights action for GitHub. So one of the first things we did is take this action and we integrated it into our, our own YAML file that we use to deploy Accessibility Insights website. 
And on line 41, you can see where the uh, Microsoft Accessibility Insights action is being referenced in our um, in our build process. And then after then, there's a additional um, action to upload the report artifact. So, you know, to demo this one day, I don't know why, I just decided to ch change our brand color to sky blue. And um, so what I did is I went to the website and I made the change. It was a small change just to some CSS to change the, the brand color uh, to sky blue. But the accessibility insights action wouldn't let me do it because uh, the contrast is between the foreground and background does not meet the contrast ratio thresholds. So the PR was, was commented on and um, the team would not, uh, would not accept the PR. And this reached us way before it reached our users or was put in production. So this is amazing. And for the record, I did not like Sky Blue. <laughs> well, so just, just to give you an example of what a, of what a pull request that does not have this issue in it looks like. Um, you see the, here, this is another pull request. This is a routine one, but um, all the checks have passed and there are no issues uh, found on this particular one. And one of the, the neat things about this is that it will actually give you a report, a very similar to the report that you get from the Chrome and Edge extensions. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna go ahead and pull up this report. And you can see you have zero failures and also you have a cute sleeping Ada cat. The Ada cat is our mascot. And in this case, you get a cute cat that is sleeping and is happy that all is good with the world. So this is a preview of the Accessibility Insights GitHub action that is still under development, but there is nothing preventing you from using this today. And we have similar capabilities for ADO that will help you automate your workflow. These are the tools available today. We're actively working on new features and new products. We are just getting started on our mobile solution. So look for new developments there. So what you can do, um, please keep accessibility in mind at every step of the process. Um, download our tools from accessibilityinsights.io and uh, then use these tools. Um, use them to address these issues early in your product cycle. Run fast, fast whenever you make a UI change. Do an assessment to check the WCAG 2.1 compliance in your websites and uh, have an automated checks as part of your end-to-end -end tests. Also, help us drive the culture change. Design with accessibility in mind. Use accessibility insights to check for accessibility. Contribute on GitHub. Spread the word and spread the love. With that, to wrap it up, we hope you feel energized to go back and share the contents of this session with your teams. And we hope you have seen how these tools can help you create accessible products. Thank you. Thank you.